This week, we're going to talk about Chapter 11, Production and Management, Developing the Process. So in this chapter, they discuss the different phases of the development process. So we're going to go through all of those in the development cycle. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about management and effective management. And then we'll talk about all the different documentation that you should create when you are creating a game. Here are the development phases, and I'm going to go through each one. But we have concept, pre-production, prototype, production, alpha, beta, gold, and post-production. The concept phase is the very first phase, and that's just when you have an idea about the game. So you're in the concept phase as soon as you come up with an idea. Your team is very small, or it might just be you. You During this time, during this phase, you're going to create what's called the concept document. That is a document that will convey the idea of the game to other people. It's a, it's a document that you might take to your boss or take to a publisher in order to pitch your game to them. It doesn't really have any information about the gameplay or the story. It just has information that tells the, the general idea of the game. And then you'll have the genre, the platform, the target market, the rating. Those things are included. Once you have your concept document completed, then you go into the pre-production phase. Now this is the planning phase of the, of the development of the, this is the planning phase of development for your game. During this phase, you will create several documents. The first is the proposal that is a little bit more involved than the concept document. It tells a lot more about what you want, what you're planning the game to do. And then you'll create the design document. Now that goes into very, very specifics about gameplay, story, characters. And it's with the design document that your programmers will then sit down and create your game. So you're trying to work out the details of the game in this phase. You figure out your story, your characters, you're going to generally get your gameplay mechanics, all the levels and challenges that you plan to have in the game. And by the time you're done with this phase, you are ready to go into production. The prototype phase is next. What that is, is a phase that shows proof of concept. So you come up with maybe a small piece of your game to prove that you can deliver what you say your game is going to do, especially if your game has something in it that is new. You're using some new type of platform or you're using some new controller or maybe there are certain graphics or, or something that you want in the game. So you want to prove that you can actually do what you say you're going to do. Then you go into the production phase. Now this is the longest phase of the process. You are actually developing the game. You're writing all the code for the game. You're taking the design document and going through it and creating everything in the game. During this phase, you will also do what's called localization. Localization is making sure the game works for people in different parts of the world. So, you, so the location that people live, you have to change things maybe for the game. Those could be things like the language, the regulations on violence, profanity, or sexual content. And we're actually going to talk next week about localization and different places in the world, some of the things that you need to change in order to make your game acceptable in those places. Next, you go into the alpha phase. Now, once you have one complete path through the game, 
you have reached alpha. So you're still developing the game, but you can play the game all the way through. So it might not have all side quests and all of that, but you can go from beginning to end in your game at this point. All, you have all of your primary language, text, you have your basic interface, your, your game is compatible with the hardware, it meets all the minimal system requirements, and you might have placeholders for your art and audio, but the placeholders are there. Next you go into what's called the beta phase. Now once you have your complete game fix, finished, so now you've gotten all the different paths, everything is there, all your art and audio are there, all the languages are there, basically the entire game is done, and now you just want to find bugs and fix them. That is when you're in beta. And when people are beta testers, that's what they're doing. They're taking what is essentially a complete game and they're just trying to find bugs and report back if they find any so that the developers can then fix those bugs before they send the game out to a larger audience. Once the game is complete and you pretty much have all the bugs fixed or you've decided some of the bugs are going to become features, that happens too, uh, your game is ready for release. So it goes into the gold phase. The gold phase is when you're either putting the game onto a CD or DVD or you're uploading the game to a server so that people can then download it. So basically the game is being released at this point. And finally, you have the post-production phase. This is the maintenance phase. And this is where you stay after your game is released. So during this time, you'll, you'll give customer support. You might have patches, maybe some of those bugs that you decided were going to be features. You decide to fix them and send out patches. You might have updates to the game. You might have expansions to the game. And that's all done in the post-production phase. Now we're going to talk a little bit about management. Um, during this part of the chapter, they talk about iterative development, common mistakes managers make, recovery from those mistakes, and what you can do to be an effective manager. Iterative development is a three-stage design process. It's a circular process where you first design something, then you come up with a prototype of it, and then you evaluate that prototype. If there's problems, you go back to design. If there aren't problems, you go on to design. So this is kind of like design code test. So in the software development life cycle, you, in software development, you have iterative design and each piece of the code should be designed, coded and tested in this way before moving on. And you are then therefore continually refining your code. So this does not pertain to the entire production process and all the phases of production. This is for every tiny piece of code. So if you look back here, you might want your character to, to walk. You're trying to get a character to walk. So you're going to design, how do I get my character to walk? What, what keys am I going to hit? Maybe I hit the right arrow key for the character to go to the right. So then I'm going to code that. I'm going to figure out how to make the right arrow key make and have my player walk to the right. And then I'm going to test it. And so I start the start the code and I hit the arrow key and I see if the character actually walks to the right. If they don't, I have to go back and redesign. If they do, I can now move on. Well, now I want to hit the left key and make my character go left. So I'm going to design that. I'm going to code it. That's the prototype. And then I will evaluate it. If that works, if, it, if I can get my character to move back and forth, then I'll go back and maybe I want my character to jump when I hit spacebar. So I will design that, I will prototype it, I'll code it, and I'll evaluate it, I'll test it, 
and see if that works. So for every single step of the way, you're going to do this process. So this is what's called iterative development. So you're continually refining the code before moving on. Okay, management. What are some common mistakes that managers do? Well, the first is lack of motivation. So maybe they don't have a way to actually motivate the people who are working for them to get them to do a good job. Next, we have lack of skills. Lack of skills doesn't mean the manager has a lack of skills. That means they hire people who don't have the skills that they need. That's a problem. You might have difficult employees that you have a hard time getting them to work together. Um, you might put your um, employees into a restricted environment that doesn't work for them. Sometimes you want your employees in a bullpen, sometimes you want them in their own offices, and you have to decide what works best for your employees. So if you put them in an environment that isn't working, that's not good. Insufficient tracking means you're not keeping track of where your employees are in their project and that they're continually staying on schedule and in budget. So that's not good. You need to be on top of that. You might have an incomplete task list or unplanned tasks. Uh, you need to make sure that all the tasks for the entire project are identified before you start the project and that no unplanned tasks come up in the middle of the project because you, you then don't have time to complete those tasks. Also, if there are misunderstandings between people or between management and employees, that can be a problem. Here is a list of what not to do to recover from mistakes. So a manager should never plan to catch up later. That never works. You're going, getting behind. You need to figure out why you're getting behind and catch up now. You never want to require mandatory overtime. Now, sometimes at the end of a project, everybody needs to work overtime. But make sure that if your employees are working overtime, you as a manager are also working overtime. You never want to just start adding more people to the project. That's hard to do. Sometimes you might need more people, but adding people also means those people need time to ramp up and learn what's going on and figure it all out. And that is not a good way to recover from a mistake. And holding more meetings is also not a good way to recover from mistakes. So for effective management, you want to make sure that you're asking people for input instead of just issuing orders. Ask them how they think that, that the problems can be solved or what can be done. Um, involve the team in the planning stage. Make sure that the team gets to give input and in how long they think they're gonna, it's going to take them to do um, different tasks and what the tasks they think there should be. Encourage employees to discuss problems before they become really big problems. Um, make sure you get all the facts before making decisions. It's always good to just think, hmm, let me, let me think about that, or I'll check, a, check, you know, let me get back to you. Um, make sure that employees have several hours of uninterrupted work each day, which is, goes back to the don't have too many meetings. Um, make sure that they can sit down and get their work done. Um, again, if employees work overtime, you should as well. And make sure that when they hit certain milestones, you give them a reward. And that might not be a huge thing. It might just be, oh, we finished level one. Let's have donuts, you know, and bring them donuts. So that's how you know that you're being an effective manager. Now we're going to talk about game documentation. Documentation it's a huge part of the game design process. There are documents that you have to write. There's a lot of writing that has to go on to make sure that the game gets created in the way that you want it to. The first document is the concept document. And I'm actually going to go through each of these and describe 
what they are. You have the premise, the player motivation, the unique selling proposition, the target market, the genre, the target rating, the target platform and hardware requirements, license, competitive analysis, and goals. So the premise, which is also known as the high concept, that is one or two sentences that describes the game. This might be what you find on the front of the game box, or maybe just the short description of the game if you're looking at games online. Here's some examples of premises. Okay, Animal Crossing. Create a home, interact with cute animal villagers, and just enjoy island life in this charming game. That tells you what the game is about. That is the premise. The Talos Principle. Great game, by the way. Assume the role of a sentient artificial intelligence placed within a simulation of humanity's greatest ruins and linked together through an arcane cathedral. Players are tasked with solving a series of increasingly complex puzzles woven into a metaphysical parable about intelligence and meeting in an inevitably doomed world. So that is two sentences. It's a little on the longer side, but it tells you what this game is about. Without telling you the story, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you a whole lot of stuff. It tells you just in two sentences what the game is about. How about Minecraft? Explore randomly generated worlds and build amazing things from the simplest of homes to the grandest of castles. Play in creative mode with unlimited resources or mine deep into the world in survival mode. Crafting weapons and armor to fend off the dangerous mobs. And finally, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Travel across fields, through forests, and to, as, to mountain peaks as you discover what has become of the ruined kingdom of Hyrule in this stunning open-air adventure. So that is what a premise should look like. And you're going to have an assignment where you're going to write a bit, a small, very short concept document, and you're going to have to write a premise, and I want it to be something like this. Then we have player motivation. Player motivation is what are the important, important aspects of gameplay. So you might discuss how to win the game or parts of the, parts of the um, play of the game. Um, reasons to continue to play the game. So here are some examples. An educational game that teaches algebra, calculus, and differential equations. So it's not telling you specifically um, well, it is. It's telling you what the game is about. Okay, run around collecting acorns of wolverines and rocks to exchange for scantron sheets and progress past the exam puzzles. So this is telling you the things that you need to do in the game to win the game or to progress through the game. You'll have players running for their umbrellas as more and more objects drop from the sky. Okay, that's telling you an important aspect of gameplay. Unique selling proposition is what makes this game unique? How is this one different than every other game that is out there? So say you have a racing game. You know, how is your racing game different than any other racing game? Maybe you're racing backwards. Maybe you're racing on some kind of, you know, motorcycles or bicycles or something that isn't out there, you know, right now. You're trying to do something unique. So you want to say what that unique thing is to try to get people to, to purchase your game or to try to get a publisher to publish your game. Target market is who are you going to market the game to? And you might look at an age group. You might also look at a type of player uh, hardcore players are very different than casual players. In fact, the largest difference of players isn't male, female, or age. It's are you hardcore or casual. It also might, your target market might be you're marketing to a certain place in the world. You know, different areas of the United States, people have different interests. So maybe if you have a hunting and fishing game, you might market more to the Midwest. Um, if you have a game playing polo, you know, maybe it'll be to England or 
you know, you have a game, a surfing game. Maybe it would be to people who live in the by oceans. So who is your target market? It's more than just an age group. The genre, of course, you need to tell us what the genre is going to be. And we talked all about genres um, in chapter three. So you'll want to explain what genre you're going to pick for your game. The target rating, that would be the ESRB rating that you're hoping to hit for the game. The target platform and hardware requirements, you know, you don't, you might be having a game for a certain platform and you'll want to list what that is. License is you only if you're planning to use copyrighted material. So if you're using some kind of material that comes from somewhere else, you are going to have to get a license for it. If you're using, um, remember we talked about the licensor in the last chapter. This is the person who gets you your license. Um, so if you're going to be doing something from Disney, you'll need a license or, um, something, anything that's already copyrighted, you'll have to get permission to use that content. Competitive analysis is you are trying to show how your game is going to compete against other games that are probably similar. So, you know, why, why is your game, um, better? You know, why do you think you'll sell more of your games? Maybe competitive analysis also might talk about the hardware that your game is going to be used on or if you need certain controllers or something. So you're analyzing the competitiveness of your game. Goals. Goals are the expectation for the game as an experience. Um, are you trying to achieve a certain mood, excitement, tension, challenge, suspense, nostalgia, you know, a warm fuzzy feeling? Are you trying to Make it humorous. Um, are you trying to scare people? Are you are you trying to prov you know provide an educational experience? So these are the goals. What what do you want this game to give to the player? Next we have the that was the concept document, and then next we have the proposal. The proposal is also created during the concept phase. And this is just a larger document that gives a little more information about your game. So you'll have the hook, gameplay, online features, technology, art and audio features, production details, backstory, story synopsis, character descriptions, risk analysis, a development budget, and concept art. I'm going to talk about most of these. Gameplay, those are the types of challenges that your game is going to have. So you're going to want to describe the different challenges. You'll describe all the different path choices, um, what kind of activities are in your game. Is your game combat, exploration, collecting, puzzle solving, construction management, racing, on and on and on. So you will describe the gameplay of the game, but you don't have to get down to controls. We don't need to talk about controls at this point. You just might want to talk, you'll just be talking about the types of challenges and the type of gameplay. Backstory. The backstory is everything that's happened before the game starts. So, you know, if, if a princess has been kidnapped and you're going, the game starts and you have to go save the princess, then the backstory is describing how the princess got kidnapped and how you found out about it and why you're on this quest to save the princess. So it's like the, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away that what happens at the beginning of every Star Wars movie, they're telling you the backstory. Story synopsis is a longer description of the story. It might be a couple of paragraphs. It tells you the basic the basic story without going into all the details, but it's it's letting someone see, you know, what the story is about and how it's going to be exciting and why it's compelling. Character descriptions. 
and we have we will have a whole chapter on characters and creating characters but with a character description in the proposal document you will want um, to to list for each character their name their race their age a physical description all their personality traits their background their history and the relevance to the game's story and this might not only be player characters this would be all the non-player characters all the characters that are in your game each of them should have a detailed description risk analysis what can possibly go wrong during the production phase maybe you'll have a hard you think you might have a hard time recruiting personnel because they have to have certain expertise uh, maybe you're waiting on delivery of something that's being you know produced a new controller and you don't know if that's going to arrive in time um, maybe you're using some experimental technology and you're not sure it's going to work right so you're having to an analyze the risks of staying on budget and within the schedule that you plan to get your game out. Concept art, that's another part of the proposal, which are concept art or um, drawings or sketches that give a visual idea of what the game is going to look like. And so you'll want to have some drawings of the game's environment, the background, some the characters, weapons, clothing, um, items, all these different things that you might find to give uh, the publisher or whoever you're pitching your game to an idea of what the game will look like. Then, so that was the proposal. Okay, so we've talked about the concept document, we've talked about the proposal document. Then we have a game design document. And the game design document is a huge document that goes very, very much into detail about every single tiny aspect of the game. It would talk specifically about the controls of the game, what buttons do what, what you want your characters to do. Um, it's, it's very low level. It's what then the programmers are gonna take to program the game. So the game interface is one part. That's the controls, all the different controls of the game. It's also what the what the player will see on the screen. And we're going to have a, um, a whole chapter on interface as well. But you have to write this document to actually describe the specific interface between the player and the game. You'll also want to have very specific description of characters' abilities and items what the characters, their complete story throughout the game, uh, the different choices they can make, uh, how they move, what they can carry, uh, how they can develop, you know, everything about the characters very specifically have to be described in the, um, the game design document. You'll also want to describe the game engine. Now you might be writing your own game engine, in which case you need to define everything you need to have in your game engine, or you might use an already existing game engine. Um, game Salad is one that you, that is on the Mac. Um, Unity, you've probably heard of. There's an RPG Maker. There's a whole lot of different game engines. Um, and there's one called Game Maker, which is one that we're going to be doing some um, some work with. I'm going to have you do tutorials in Game Maker. When I have my class do group projects, I have them actually create the game using Game Maker. But um, since you're doing the projects on your own, we're not actually going to create the games. However, I want to give you some experience using a game engine to create games, which is why we'll use Game Maker to do some of the tutorials. After the design document, you need a test plan. The test plan is literally how you're going to uh, test your game. It's all the different steps. This is usually created, created by the quality assurance people. It gives um, meticulously step-by-step -step um, all of the different things that you're going to check to do black box, black box testing of the game. Um, also, 
to make sure that all of the development standards are adhered to. Um, this is very, very detailed plan on how to test the game to make sure that it's working properly before you deliver it. Okay, well, that's the end. So in summary, we talked about the development phases. We talked about management. We talked about game documentation. And um, make sure that you know all the phases and that you know all the game documentation and what is in each part of that documentation. So have a great week, and I'll talk to you next week.